and welcome to this year's Jason Project, Planet Earth. Right now we're watching some of the newest land on our planet being formed here on the Big Island of Hawaii. This volcano is one of the most important scientific uh, laboratories for scientists trying to understand volcanoes. And by studying volcanoes, we're really studying the very essence of what makes planet Earth unique. It's volcanoes that have created our oceans, our atmospheres, and that are responsible for the life on our planet. We're driving right along the delta of where this lava is going into the sea. It's about seven different breakout points all along a stretch of seacoast that is about a mile and a half, two miles long, coming down from the poly, heading down into the sea from a central caldera called Pu'u'u'u, which we'll be going up to in a few minutes. But before we do that, let us introduce the scientists who will be a part of this project today. Dr. Maddox is kind of a resident expert on the moves of this volcano. He's been walking these fields as a scientist, a park ranger, and an educator. Dr. Samson has a special interest in the ocean around this island. He's even gone scuba diving in the middle of an eruption. Steve and Frank are going to teach you a lot about volcanoes. volcanic processes are at work elsewhere in the solar system, we're going to drop in on Dr. John Spencer up at the NASA observatory about 45 miles from here. He's heading up that research effort for us. John works mostly in Arizona, but he can look through his telescope on Hawaii using telepresence. Of course, we don't have to look too far to know that one of the things that makes Earth unique is its rich abundance of living things. You may not know it, but without volcanoes, life on Earth might never have developed. We need to examine the way plants and animals have adapted and changed, and the best place to do that is right here with project biologist Ken Kaneshiro. Ken is studying some of the unique species that live only on Hawaii. Washington, D.C., Cheryl Tarr. Cheryl carries out genetic analyses of the species to create a molecular family tree tracing their ancestors back hundreds of thousands of years. We've uh, moved the helicopter uh, just a short distance down the road from the active flows. You can see our production facilities. We're going to go in now and land at our primary base camp, which is right down here. So we're going to go down and land. But you can see we're very, very close to the volcanic flows. In fact, we had to move the site a, a day or so ago when the lava took out about 500 feet of the road. So we have to be constantly on the alert. Our vehicles are all pointed in the escape direction. All right, we're going to come down now and... I'll need the script later. All right, we're here we are. 
are back at our base camp after a wild ride. Uh, we're on the lava flows of uh, Kamoa Moa, which is situated at the base of what's called the East Rift Zone. The summit of the main volcano, Kilauea, is over that ridge, or poly, and it sits on the flank of the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa. From Kilauea, you can see Mauna Kea, where the NASA observatory is located. Uh, all right, we're in contact with that observatory by fault line and through our Jason uh, computer network so that our students here at our, our astronomy uh, segment can talk to uh, Dr. John Spencer up on the observatory. Now over here is where we have our biology station and we have a number of researchers and student argonauts working here including uh, Dr. Ken Kaneshiro. Hi Ken. Hi Bob. And uh, with him are two argonauts and over at the far table is Cheryl Tarr. And uh, Cheryl, how you doing? Okay, we also have technology associated. We have the Marzikoff vehicle uh, which we can use to uh, operate uh, remotely uh, from the site. We also have a lava crane, and we can use that lava crane. In fact, a student uh, during the course of this hour will operate the lava crane. And uh, now that we've sort of introduced to you the, the setting, where we are, the lava fields here, the base camp here, Pu'u'o up there, where a student is right now, our scientists and some of our technology, we'd like to start the program. And the best way to do that is to go back to the ancient Hawaiians who came to these islands about one to 2,000 years ago. And when they arrived, they learned that their new home was a very uh, violently uh, active volcano, and it could be very dangerous for them to live here. And so they developed stories, and they passed those stories on from one generation to another through their Hawaiian storytellers. So we're gonna go to one of our Hawaiian storytellers and have her give us the ancient Hawaiian version for the origin of these islands. Pele Honua Mea was from a land far, far across the ocean called Kahiki. She was born and raised by her parents, Papa Haumea, or Papa Honua Mea as we know her, and Lono Makua, who was her uncle. Lono Makua was the one responsible for teaching her how to make the most lovely fires. It was because of her interest of fire making that got her into trouble back in Kahiki. Namako Kohai, her eldest sister, was the deity of the ocean. Namako Kahai and Pele were constantly arguing, arguing about who would take this, arguing about who would take that. Finally, Namako Kahai decided that Pele had to leave Kahiki. Because Pele was a younger sibling, it was Pele who had to leave. And so Pele, downhearted, called all of her siblings together. You'll come with me to our new home, our new home over the sea. Nihua was the first island and Pele and her family came upon. Dig me a pit, she said. Dig me a pit in which we can make our fires, in which we can make our new home. However, the island was unsuitable. They left Nihua and went on to the island of Lehua. Again, the island was unsuitable. It was not deep enough. There was too much water around, Pele commanded. Dig, dig, dig until you find us a new home. However, there was water at the bottom of the pit. And they left the island of Lehua and came upon the island of Ni'ihau. And still, Pele was unsatisfied with the Aina. And so from Ni'ihau, they moved to Kauai. Still, the Aina was not suitable. And from Kauai, they moved to Oahu, and the island was not suitable. And from Oahu, they moved to Molokai. And from Molokai, they moved to Lanai. And from Lanai, they moved to Kaho'olawe until they reached the island of Maui. And it was there in the pit of Haleakala that Pele and her family were able to live and dwell for a little while, for a little while, until Namako Kahai caught up with them. And it was there they got into a great, great battle, a battle which ensued for days, a battle which left Pele, her mortal body, dead. But this did not stop Pele. She again gathered up all her brothers and sisters from the pit and said, 
we must go. And so Pele and his brothers and sisters went upon Kamohoali'i again, boarded the vessel and came upon Hawaii, came upon Hawaii, the island on which they still dwell. Hawaii, in the pit of Hale Maumau, at Kilauea, on the slopes of Mauna Loa, here she is today, still building land for us. The cycle of the story begins again. <laughs> That, that very dramatic story that you just heard, uh, based in ancient Hawaiian lore, uh, turns out to be actually scientifically accurate. Uh, we now know that the uh, island of Hawaii has uh, over a hot spot, and that as the plate of the Pacific moves over that hot spot, it sequentially built the island and, and repeated the exact story that Paley just told you. And to uh, further support that scientific observation, we're now going to go to our field geologist, uh, Steve Maddox out in the field. This flow that we're walking on uh, yesterday and uh, has been flowing down towards the ocean ever since. Right now it's about oh, 700, 800 feet long and it's about ready to cascade over a cliff and go out to the ocean. Uh, what do you think of these active flows? you like walking on them? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel? Hot. Is it a little scary? Not really. Not really. Not too bad. Not if you know the right things to do. Let's walk over here where we can get to the edge of the flow and uh, show the students at the site how we can tell when we're walking on an active flow and how we can tell when we're on a colder flow because, to be honest, I enjoy the sounds of walking on the active lava, but uh, it gets a little hot out here. And so what I'd like to do is stay on the older flows just as much as I can. Well, let's have a look. Veronica, what's the first thing you notice about the lava flow here? How can you tell the young hot flow from the older cold flow? The younger is a lot hotter and uh, a lot smoother. A lot smoother? Um, is it glassy? Yeah. How about sound? Do we hear very much? It sounds like breaking glass. Breaking glass and snap, crackle, pop. Um, do you smell anything from it? Yeah. Just a little bit. And what about heat waves? You can see a lot. <laughs> right, so when we're out walking on the flow field, we look for heat waves. If we need lava sample, that's where we go. Let's do a, a, a little demonstration to see how hot it is. So how hot's that? Above 100 degrees Celsius. Celsius. Yeah, but we know it's below the melting temperature of our shoes. I think we have a question from a pen side, if we can have the question now. Is there a lot of underground volcanic activity in Hawaii? We, the question is, is there underground volcanic activity in Hawaii? Under the surface of the volcano, there's magma. So when the liquid rock is beneath the surface, uh, we call it magma. When it's on the surface like this, we call it lava. And so there's a plumbing system behind the volcano that feeds the magma from the summit of Kilauea volcano down to the Pu'u'u'u cone, the Pu'u'u'u vent, and then from there down to this area. And we'll have a good close look at that in just a minute. So we do have liquid rock moving beneath the island right now. Veronica, let's take our tepper traps over to Matt and see what he's been doing today. Hi, Matt. How's Hello. your work going on the tepper sample? Oh, it's going very well. It's going very well. What'd you find? Well, I was looking through and um, I found, found a lot of glass particles. Mm -hmm. I found some uh, Pele's hair. Pele's hair and uh, it was it was it was quite interesting actually since I I'd, I'd never seen that before and there are all different sizes of it too I thought it was just one uniform length and size but uh, I was wrong um, and I've also found some limu limu and um, that too that too is glassy and it breaks very easily when I poke at it mm -hmm. and um, both of them seem to be very light when I mean the wind can uh, pick, move them around yeah, inside the careful glass there. I did not find any crystals though. The olivine crystals? Yes. I haven't pretty found, rare. Yeah, I haven't found any of those yet. I, was, I hope sometime I'll be able to see one of those. Great. Um, now, all, all these are carried around by the wind? You bet. Uh, as soon as the lava hits the water, there's steam generated and it carries particles up into the air. Uh, and it's, uh, 
Why does the lava hit the water? Where does it come from? Well, it's flowing downhill. It is? Mm -hmm. From where? Uh, the vent, which is upslope, a couple miles away. Would you like to have a closer look at it? Yeah. Okay, let's walk over to a high point, and All then right. from there, uh, we can get a good view of the volcano. All right. Veronica, if you'd like, you can keep looking at our tester samples. Okay, we have another question. We can answer that while we're going over to the, the high area here. have on the earth and its natural resources. The question is something about the natural resources, but I didn't catch the first catch. What positive and negative effects do volcanoes have on the earth and its natural resources? Oh, the positive and negative effects. Uh, first off, there's a lot of heat involved, and in some places on this island, people use the heat uh, for energy, so that's one positive effect. Another positive effect is that we have a beautiful island here and it's created by this volcanic activity. The negative effect, we've had an eruption going on for a long time period. It's done a lot of damage to the atmosphere. And by that, uh, I'm talking about the steam plume that's generated and it uh, irritates some people's respiratory system. We've also had some beautiful areas along this coastline that have been destroyed and buried under the lava and I wish we, we could have those back. Okay, up to the volcano to have a look to see what the volcano, uh, the helicopter can see. What do you think of your first ride up there? How is it? Oh, it's great. This is so cool. I love it. Well, all of our Argonauts, we send up one every hour. So uh, a lot of the student Argonauts are having the thrill of their lives getting up to the eruptive crater of Pula. Uh oh And now you're looking down the rift uh, that heads towards us, right? Okay, thank you. They've been up showing us a good view of the Pu'u'u'u cone, so what I'd like to do is just run a little bit of animation, some video, so we can see how the magma goes from the summit of Kilauea down the east rift zone to the Pu'u'u'u cone. We have a dike system that extends from the summit of Kilauea volcano down into the flank, and these dikes are really conduits that feed the magma from the summit of the volcano down into the flank. And you can see the dike is a very tall feature and maybe one meter wide. And so that's how the magma gets from the summit of the volcano down into the flank. Now once again, once the magma reaches the surface, we call it lava. So the lava has to go from the vents that are on the flank of the Pu'u'u'u cone down here to the coastal area. And it does that in lava too. So if we look up slope, we can see some clouds and those are close to where the Pu'u'u'u cone is. And then there's just a little bit of fume that so shows the lava tube that goes off to the east, and that lava eventually reaches the ocean and generates the lava entries we saw earlier in the program. There's another tube that comes down this way, and it, once it gets down low, it splits into about three fingers, and we're right on the edge of one of those fingers, and one of the other fingers is going over to the other program. Now, now what we're going to do is go over to Frank Sanson, and he's near the edge of a lava flow, and he can show us what they look like at the surface. Frank, are you there? Yeah, we're ready. We're coming over here to take a look at this active flow, and just make sure it's hot enough for our sampling, and we'll stick a temperature probe in, and Andre's going to give us some readings here. What do you got there? It's, about, it's almost up to 500 degrees now. Yeah, it's uh, 600 degrees. Or, yeah, 600 degrees. Okay. Now, 
It's quickly going up. 700 already. Okay, this one's definitely hot. It should be up about 11 or 1200 when we finally get get to it, but I'm getting toasted there, and this is definitely a hot enough lava flow. But what I'd like to show you is that if we take some precautions, we can actually sample the lava pretty easily. And we're going to simulate what happens out in front of the lava flows where the lava goes into the ocean. So we're going to open up a little tongue, a little toe here, and, and let some lava come out. We'll let it, the red stuff come out. Get the red, get the red lava. Oops. Pretty sticky stuff. And then to make sure we don't burn our cord. And we're gonna dump this in the water. Now this is truly sticky lava, it doesn't want to come off. But okay, the temperature reading was about 30 degrees beforehand. And now we can see this is what, about 25, I think that's yeah. right. It's going to about 10 degrees up. We'll use this as an experiment to test what happens to the seawater when the molten lava comes into it. And we'll let this cook for a while. But meanwhile, I'll show you what we found last show when we, we, we took one of these rocks out. And you'll see inside that there's all these large openings. And what seawater goes into the rock, and as soon as it touches the hot lava, it turns into steam and it expands and creates these, these openings here and it gets so buoyant that it'll actually float. So if you look out in front of the, in front of the ocean there, you'll, you'll uh, be able to see these things floating on the, on, the, uh, on the seawater. So we have a question, I believe. I guess we'll continue. Anyhow, so what we'll do with this experiment afterward is we'll filter out the particles. Okay, we have a question. Is it harmful to breathe in Pele's hair? Is it yeah, harmful to breathe in Pele's hair? I don't know if the camera could show. It. Okay, so we have. Uh, if you get this in your in your uh, lungs, they're small enough they can embed into your lungs, and that would be pretty bad. So we try to wear masks when we go out to an area where we have a lot of Pele's hair being uh, produced. So anyhow, we'll analyze this water in the lab back at the university. Look at the, how the seawater changes, and this gives us an idea of what the lava flows do to the ocean when the lava goes in the sea here over Kilauea. So, um, do you have any questions about this kind of thing, or? Well, uh, uh, what is the, the difference between the steam produced here from the freshwater and the steam produced out of the steam plume? Well, one of the things that's very unusual that people have discovered is that when seawater goes, is hit by, by low, molten lava, you produce a lot of hydrochloric acid and the hydrochloric acid is hydrogens and chloride. And, and this chlorine comes from the seawater where there's a lot of uh, sodium chloride. And it actually is a very interesting reaction that we're working on to figure out how the chlorine actually gets into the hydrogen, chlor hydrogen chloride gas. So I guess we're gonna, we're gonna let this thing cook for a while. And in the meantime, we're gonna take it back to Steve who's back up on the lava flows. Steve. Okay, we're here with the geologist, in fact, the gas geochemist from the U.S. Geological Survey, and his name is Jeff Sutton. Jeff, what are you about to do here? Well, we're about to take a sample of gas as it boils out of the lava here. We have this gas collection bottle, which we open up and collect the sample out of the, of the lava. And we seal the bottle up, and we'll take this sample back. Okay. And we'll Let's take it over to your instrument. Analyze it here. What kind of instrument do you have set up for us? Well, this is a gas chromatograph. Okay. And what the gas chromatograph does is it takes this mixture of gases that we have here and takes this mixture and then separates the mixture of gases and then analyzes them. Okay. Now, why would you want to do something like that? Okay. Uh, the reason we do that, we want to know the, the various amounts of the gases that are, uh, that are in the, the gas sample. And what and kind of gases are, do you usually find? What we usually find, we have varying amounts of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide and water vapor uh, down here. Mm -hmm. uh, the sulfur dioxide, isn't that a greenhouse gas? The sulfur dioxide is a greenhouse gas, the way, same way carbon dioxide is. Mm -hmm. uh, sulfur dioxide acts a little differently from carbon dioxide. 
carbon dioxide tends to make the, the planet a little warmer. Mm -hmm. Sulfur dioxide tends to make the planet cool off a little bit if there are great amounts of it. Are there health concerns with the, the volcanic gases here? There can be, yeah. In fact, we've, we've uh, gone to some, uh, some great uh, lengths to make sure that everybody here is, is uh, in good shape as far as uh, being protected from the, the levels of gases that we would expect to see here. So. Okay. Well, Jeff, thank you for showing us some of your geologic research that you're doing here for the Volcano Observatory. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do now is look at a different type of sampling tool. And what we have behind me here is a lava crane. And the lava crane was designed by Engineers Cell Corporation. And uh, the engineers there realized that at times geologists cannot work in a very dangerous setting. One type of setting would be a skylight right above a lava tube where it's way too hot. So what they did was design an instrument that has an arm that can reach out. This arm has a probe that it can take the temperature of a lava flow and also take a sample so the geologist can analyze that. This probe is lowered on a very long arm. There's also a camera right here so you can see what you're doing. And there's a heat shield to protect it from the large amount of heat, five, six, seven hundred degrees Celsius above the lava tube. Let's go around onto the side and I'll show you a little bit more about the lava crane. It's got about four legs. Here's the first leg, and notice that it is adjustable. The lava is very uneven, so to get to the platform level, we have to have some adjustable legs. Coming back a little farther, we have some wheels, and you can see the wheels are on a track, and it actually moves back and forth, and this moves the platform horizontally. Coming around the back, you can really see the muscle and the brains behind this machine. Here's the muscle. There's a bunch of switches that run motors that move winches and move the platform and the arm. And here's the brains. And what the brains do is allow this instrument to be worked uh, by telepresence to move the probe up and down. So let's move on around the front. OK, we'll have a question as we move around to the front. Go ahead, please. What is the highest temperature ever recorded for lava? Um, I think the hottest temperature ever recorded for lava might be something near, oh boy, 1,500, 1,600 degrees Celsius. A lot hotter than the temperatures for current lava flows like Kilauea. Those flows are older uh, and erupted when the Earth was hotter. So here we are at the front end of the telescope. I'd like to talk to, to David and also the students of Pinsight, and they'll operate our lava crane. Are you there? Yes, yeah, Steve, we have um, a student from the NASA Ames Pin site. His name is Rainier, and uh, he's ready to drive the crane now. Okay, first off, uh, before Rainier gets started, David, I need you to move the platform out about three feet, which is about three seconds, I believe. Okay. So we have some horizontal movement involved to take our sample. That's great. Thank you, David. Now, Rainier, what I need you to do is to extend the probe. So that's probe down for about uh, three seconds. Probe down. Okay, you're doing great. Probe down. Keep going. Okay, slow down a little bit. Uh, I need to probe down for one or two more seconds. And uh, let's see, one more time, please, Rainier. You're doing great. We're going to get down to the lava. Just a little bit more. Okay, uh, David, can you pull the uh, platform back about one and a half seconds? Sure. Okay, we're very close. If we had a lava flow now, what we could do is plunge into it with the probe, take a sample, then retract it. Rainier, can you bring the probe up, please? So we've had a successful demonstration of the technology that Bechtel's given to us for taking a lava sample. Let's go back to Bob. All right, thank you, Steve. You know, thus far in the program, uh, we've shown you the importance that lava plays in the origin of our oceans and our atmospheres, and as we'll talk about later on, actually, for the creation of life on our planet. Were it not for volcanoes, we probably wouldn't have life on Earth. So the obvious question you want to ask is, uh, well, are there volcanic activity on other planets in our solar system? We know that there's been previous activity in Mars and Venus, but not now. But there actually is one location uh, in our solar system right now that we know of that there is active volcanism, and that's on a moon. 
uh, next to the uh, planet of Jupiter. And uh, we're here with our astronomers, uh, student Argonauts, and why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Derek Martin from Meeker, Oklahoma. Derek? I'm LaFon Hogan from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we have telescopes here. There's also another one behind me. You might think that, well, you know, how could you possibly be using them during the day? But you can, particularly when you're looking up at Jupiter, which is right up in this neck of the woods. But there is a much more powerful uh, telescope, and that's up on uh, Mauna Kea, where the NASA Observatory is. And up there we have Dr. John Spencer. Uh, John, are you on the line? I guess they're uh, still working. John, are you on the, on the line yet? All right, well, while they work to hook him up, uh, why don't you ask uh, some questions? Maybe I can answer them for you. Um, well, the volcanoes on Earth are what created our oceans and what created our atmosphere. On Io, are these same effects taking place? No, not at all, actually. A uh, very different kind of volcanism going on on the planet of Io. Most importantly, the uh, planet is very, very small and it doesn't have much gravitational force, so it, it can't uh, capture the gases that are vented, particularly the ones that are important to us, like, uh, like H2O. I understand now that we do have John on the horn. John, can you hear me? I sure can. Well, John, uh, let How's me... How's it going uh, down there? Oh, it's just great, you know. It's, uh, it's getting a little warm, but fortunately we've got clouds, uh, which uh, we like, but you don't like, as I understand it. Yeah, uh, we're sitting in the cloud up here. We're not getting any data. All right, well, while you have that respite, let me uh, bring some of our Argonauts online. And uh, you had a question for John, didn't uh, yeah. you? Yeah, John, I wanted to know, are the volcanoes on Io made or created the same way as they are here in Hawaii? Um, I, you'll have to repeat the question. The question was, um, is the process that's responsible for the creation of volcanoes on Earth the same processes that create volcanoes on Io? No, not at all. In fact, Io is a very strange place. It's it's orbiting very close to this enormous planet Jupiter, and the uh, uh, gravity of Jupiter is distorting Io enormously. The side of Io that faces Jupiter is like, bulges like six miles higher than the other side, and that really distorts the inside of Io and really heats it up, and it's like taking a paperclip or something and bending it backwards and forwards, and you, you generate a lot of heat. Um, and that same process is happening on, in Io, and it's so much that there's a hundred times as much heat coming out of Io as a result of the Earth. <laughs> All right, well, John, we understand okay. that you've uh, captured some recent images uh, with your telescope. Could you show them? Um, yes, in fact, uh, we, there should be an image of Jupiter that we took this morning that's available. If not, there's a picture of... Okay. Okay, that's the picture we took just a few hours ago before the clouds rolled in. And this image shows Jupiter heat radiating out of Jupiter. We have an infrared camera here, not an ordinary photographic camera. So we're seeing heat radiation. And in the same way, we can see the heat radiation from Io as well, uh, from its volcanoes. The volcanoes are so powerful that even from half a billion miles away here on Earth, we can, we can see them glowing. And yesterday, we saw three volcanoes erupting on Io. This morning, we're not sure if we saw any because conditions weren't quite so good. But there's an image you can show, I think, that shows Io uh, next to Jupiter that we took yesterday, um, which, in which Io is in Jupiter's shadow and it's glowing in the dark from the heat of all those volcanoes. Well, John, uh, we understand you have an exercise that you're going to work with our pin site, so let's see uh, how well they've done their astronomy and their homework. <laughs> Sounds good to me. This will actually use the image of showing Io and Jupiter, so I hope that image is now on the screen, on the center screen at the pin site. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, the exercise is uh, on, you have a computer screen there where you have a little picture of Io orbiting Jupiter, and Io, that's in the right-hand window, Io's a little dot that you can move around Jupiter by moving that slider along the, the bottom, or by moving the forwards and backwards buttons on the on the control panel there. And what you will need to do is to find out the side of Io we're looking at in that picture we took yesterday that's up on the screen. We need to know where Io was in its orbit. And you can move Io around with that slider until it's in the same position relative to Jupiter as it is in our actual image. And on the left, you'll see a nice globe of Io made from close-up spacecraft pictures that will rotate to show the correct side of Io at each point in its orbit. And if you want to go ahead and do that now and try and get it in, this, in the same position relative to Jupiter as it is in our um, telescope image, then 
when you do that, we'll, you'll, have, you'll be seeing the right side of Io that we're actually looking at in that telescope image. And the, to give you a bit of a hint, the, the correct number should be larger than about 240 degrees, and the number in degrees on the left-hand side of the pa control panel there is a number that needs to be bigger than 240. And when you think you've got the right answer, hit this. Huh? Okay, you guys are doing great. Okay, we have um, a lot of people, Las Vegas has it right, Minnesota has it right, a whole bunch of people got this right. We're going to have to make this exercise more difficult. Um, you will see um, that the, the longitude that you have should be around 340 degrees. That would be the right answer, but anything pretty close to that is, is really good going. So, well done, you guys. And you will now see that the... Is a close-up view of Io on your panel will now correspond to the site that we were looking at for the volcanoes yesterday. I'm going to have to go now. I'll hand you back to, to Bob. Well, thank you, John. I hope the uh, clouds clear up for you, at least up where you are. I'd like to keep them where I am right now because it's <laughs> taking the heat off the Well, day, we'll see if we can arrange that. Well, good luck with your research. All right. Well, thank clearly, you well, you bet, John. We'll talk to you later. Clearly, the more we look at our planet, and particularly when we can work with someone like John and compare what's going on here at Earth to what's going on in the rest of the solar system, we realize how truly unique Earth is. And we also realize the important role that volcanism plays in Earth's uniqueness. And certainly the most unique characteristic of our planet is its, uh, is its life system. And there's a beautiful uh, rise, and you see the... Uh, volcanic systems uh, operating here on the uh, rift system. This is just down from Pu'u'o'o summit. And then we, uh, there's the summit itself, and you look down into the caldera where our student Argonaut was, and, and then down here where the lava is flowing into the ocean. This entire process that you're observing is, is unique. You also see that even in hostile settings, uh, such as the uh, hydrothermal vents deep within the ocean, uh, where we found uh, incredible life forms that could evolve in even the, the difficult settings of, of the deep sea around geothermal vents down beneath the ocean. All of those have helped lead to the formation of life on our planet. Well, the early Hawaiians also had the, their own stories that they talked about, particularly the uniqueness of the plants on their native island of Hawaii. Long, long ago, Above the Puna rainforest lives the goddess Pele. One day as she was laying there basking in the sun enjoying the rays, she heard this noise. She was very curious to where this noise came from. This noise came from deep in the forest. But when she got deep into the rainforest, she came across this clearing. And in the clearing was this handsome young woodcarver who was carving a canoe. The woodcarver, feeling a presence of somebody being there, turned, and as he turned, he saw this beautiful maiden, the prettiest he's ever seen. It was love at first sight. After Pele stayed with him for a few days, she made her new lover promise that he would wait for her, for she needed to go back to Kilauea. He was heartbroken and devastated, so he traveled to the beach to heal his wounded heart. There he fell in love with this beautiful maiden surfing on a wave, who is full of life. Pele doesn't realize how long she has been away from her lover in the forest. She listens to hear the sounds. Nothing is there. So she travels off through the Puna rainforest to find her lover that she has left. She comes and she peeps through the trees. And what does she see in the clearing? But she sees her lover in the arms of someone else. Enraged, Pele tells him of how he has broken her promise to her and been unfaithful. Pele then says, if you want to be in the arms of another, you shall be there for eternity. She then turns them into the Ohialehua tree, the bark being hard and red, representation of the male or the kane, and the beautiful blossom representing the female maiden. And as the story goes, if you are to pick these blossoms, it will rain. It is the tears of the two lovers being separated from each other. All right. Well, now that you've heard that beautiful story by our Hawaiian storyteller about the uniqueness of the animals and plants here on the island of Hawaii, let's go to our biologists and have them tell us uh, 
about the uniqueness. And uh, at this table, we have Dr. Ken Conishero. Hi, Ken. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good. And over at the other table, we have Cheryl Tarr. Hi, Cheryl. Now, uh, in our storytellers, we just we had two storytellers during the course of the program. We had one that told us about the origin of the islands, and the other that told us uh, about the origin of the plant life on our on the islands. And mm -hmm. it turns out that those stories are pretty good stories, aren't they? Right, uh, absolutely. In fact, the the geological history of the islands, the sequential formation of the islands, are very very important uh, parts of our uh, biology, and uh, it, it'll help explain the evolutionary history of these species. Uh, but before we get to the, the uh, Drosophila flies that we'll be talking about uh, in a few minutes, I believe the, uh, the students at the various pin sites have collected some data from uh, the spiders that they've collected. And why don't we cut away to that now and see what they have. The, um, the, the numbers of uh, spiders that they collect. Okay, I guess uh, they, they can't get the, uh, the data up on screen, so we'll just go on to our flies. Uh, Angela, why don't you uh, work this uh, special camera here, which we'll be able to use to uh, record some of the courtship behavior. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Jeremy, can you hand me the uh, vial of flies that we've already collected from the field? Thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll get that ready for the experiments in just a moment. Uh, we'll get you. How are we doing, Angela? They're hiding. You, they're hiding, huh? Yeah. Okay, obviously uh, this environment here is not the, the, the uh, natural environment for these flies. They're usually found up in the mountains, so the temperatures here is pretty warm, and uh, they're probably not very happy in this cage. But I think we've got some uh, tape that we've pre-recorded on the Hawaiian Drosophila, and uh, we'll, we'll get to see the, the courtship on, on the screen there. Oh, there we go. Uh, that's that's Drosophila clabosici from the island of Maui. And look at how that male has its abdomen up and over his head and vibrating his abdomen. He's got his wings spread out. The male has his mouth part stuck out. And watch what the female is going to do now. He's actually kissing the male. So here's a chemical cue, a visual cue, and even a tactile cue with, with, when the male uh, kisses the female. And all the time, he, the male is actually singing. Here's, here's another species. This is Drosophila sylvestris from the, from the island of Hawaii, this island. It's up, uh, found up in the rainforest. And these are two males that's going through uh, fighting uh, aggressive behavior. Now we're seeing some courtship going on, um, a male actually trying to court the female. Again, this complex behavior that we're seeing on the screen here is, uh, goes along with some of the um, acoustical signals, the courtship songs, if you like, that uh, these, these flies also display. Okay, so uh, what, what we'll do now is, Jeremy, if you'll take some of those five flies that, uh, in the vial and transfer them to this cage so that we can get, get some closer look at these flies. Okay, great. Just pull them in there. Okay, go ahead. Great. Let's look over here. Now, by putting them in a chamber like this, a gla clear glass chamber, we'll be able to uh, look at some of the uh, very complex courtship behaviors and also listen to the song. Actually, the songs, uh, we'll be able to use a very special microphone that we've developed. Um, it's, it's a very sensitive microphone. And by putting it together with a, a homemade amplifier, which costs uh, just about $20 for this whole setup, uh, we'll be able to listen to the very uh, um, interesting songs that these uh, flies sing. Can uh, every species has a different song? That's correct, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to hear that. You, you, you'll be able to hear the differences. And so that's an important part of the mating ritual? That's exactly right. Um, so what is the mating ritual of the Drosophila found on Hawaii? Um, I, again, as we saw on the screen there, the, um, the flies go through uh, a very complex series of uh, behavioral displays, wing displays, um, using chemical pheromones as part of the display, and now the acoustical signals that we'll talk about so here. that's different from other islands? Uh, each species on each island have their own courtship uh, song and courtship display. So uh, that 
makes sure that the species don't interbreed. That's correct. That's, that's part of the isolating mechanisms, the, uh, the reproductive isolation that keeps the species apart. Now, this box here is a very special box. We, it's just a wooden box with paper on the bottom. And by attaching it to the microphone with a rubber band, just like that, uh, we'll be able to listen to these sounds. Now, we've got some pre-recorded tape, and we'll go, well, why don't we go ahead and play that right now. oscilloscope we can begin to um, see the waveforms, the actual sequence of um, waves that these, uh, these courtship uh, songs display. And we can also get a printout of these songs on a sheet like this and uh, it, it forms really a fingerprint of each, each species song. Let's take a look at, let's listen to another species. This is Drosophila melanocephala from the island of Crete. So here's a closely related species, but I, I don't think we even need the oscilloscope to hear the differences. You can hear very uh, distinct, a very distinct song that's characteristic of the species only. And again, you can see, you can make the comparisons between the waveforms of Melanocephala and Oahuensis, the previous species. Wow, they're really different. And it's, it's quite different. And the songs are created by rubbing their feet together? No, these are created by the wings. The wings are vibrant. Did you hear that burst at the end? Yeah, that, that's, that's a very significant part of the song. Uh, so that's, that's uh, um, just one way, or just one tool that we have available to us to analyze just one aspect of the courtship, and that's the, the song that they sing. Uh, another way that we were able to study these flies is using DNA. Um, you've heard about the O.J. Simpson and DNA fingerprinting. Well, we can use the same technology in analyzing the relationships between species from the Hawaiian Drosophila. Now, Cheryl Tarr from the National Zoo has been using the same DNA technology to look at the evolutionary patterns, the evolutionary relationships of the native birds. Hi, Cheryl. How are you doing? Hi, Ken. Hi, Ken. Uh, Shireen and I have just been talking about some of the uh, molecular methods that we use to look at DNA and we've been looking at some DNA sequences but I think first Shireen has a question for me. Yeah, um, what is DNA? What, what's it made of? DNA is uh, it's a molecule, it's a very large molecule and it's made up of smaller molecules though like sugars and proteins which are things that we eat every day um, but the thing about DNA is that these smaller molecules are ordered and so this organization is what allows DNA to contain information, the information to build a cell, to build an organism. So it's kind of like the building plan or blueprint for an organism. Is there a way that we can look at it? Well, we have some DNA here. Um, pull one of these samples out. And this is DNA from a bird, one of our native birds here. But when you look at it at this level, you really can't see differences. This could be Tyrannosaurus rex. This could be my big sister, okay? <laughs> you can't tell the difference. But my big sister differs a little bit from Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> and those differences are determined by differences in the DNA. But if we want to see those differences in the DNA, then we have to use these molecular methods like DNA fingerprinting, which can uh, show us differences between individuals. And we can also use DNA sequencing, which can uh, t show us differences between different species. Um, what kind of bird is that? Is the specific kind of bird? Well, this is uh, DNA from an apapani, and uh, it's one of the native Hawaiian honey creepers. They're oh. birds that live in the forest. Uh, they've evolved here in the Hawaiian Islands. They're found nowhere else on Earth. And there's quite a diversity of honey creepers. They've adapted to feed on nectar, like the spectacular ee It has a very long, decurved bill. And on the kihi, which feed on insects and nectar. They're little birds that have small bills for feeding on insects, like warblers. There's birds that feed on seeds, like, you know, we have finches. They have a bill similar to cardinals. And uh, we do have, uh, as I said, quite a diversity. But unfortunately, when you, when you look in this guide, this identification guide, you look on any single page, and 50% of the birds have gone extinct. And um, I think we're going to cut to Bob now. <laughs> All right. Use of our technology here. Uh, as you can see, technology is very important to uh, 
uh, the research programs going here uh, for our various scientists, whether it's the biologists or the, the chemists, the geologists, uh, the astronomers, all of them use technology. Well, so do we in making the Jason project possible. And one of my favorite little guys here is uh, Jimmy the Jib. Hi, Jimmy. How you doing? Jimmy uh, works here on the stage. Uh, are you union-based? No, you're not. Okay. Uh, J uh, J Jimmy the Jib uh, provides us with a great uh, uh, camera angles. We're able to move all over the, uh, the site. Why don't you uh, rise up, Jimmy, and show them the production facility across the way. And that's where the, uh, the uh, uplink trucks are and the production studios. And uh, we have one of our students over there, one of our student Argonauts, uh, who's a roving reporter, and she's going to give you a behind-the-scenes look. So let's head over there. Hi, my name is Mandala Hunter Ishikawa and I'm from the Big Island of Hawaii. And today we're going to look at the behind the scenes look at the Jason project. And we're standing in front of the truck that has all the cameras. And this is a typical production van at the edge of an active volcano. And we're going to take a look. Lots of people in here. Lots of cameras. Hi, this this is this is the director. Lower third up, please. For identification and lower third. Really busy. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Uh, this is Mandala, and that's her lower third, and we did that from one of the sources that comes into this production van. If you see on that monitor wall, all those choices of cameras that we can take and graphic information and everything you've seen so far in this program comes into this nerve center and we decide what you'll see and when you'll see it. And then it's going to go from here with the help of Barry, my technical director, and Jerry, my associate uh, director, and behind you we have all sorts of people over there. We have Chris the Chiron, we have Natasha, we have in there we have Sarah Lee, who's hiding from us. <laughs> and we have uh, a whole enormous crew of people, uh, each devoted to a specific task to help bring you the pictures and the audio that you've been seeing. And when it leaves here, it goes via satellite to your pin sites. So the next thing Model is going to do is take you to visit Mike Durbin at the satellite truck. Okay, thank you for your time. Bye. Let's go. <laughs> Bye. It's a real nice day out here. And here's Mike Durbin. He's the doctor of technology. Hi, Mike. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Just fine. Now you've seen the video and how all that audio and video gets mixed together and sent out here. And we're the ones that send it back to the pin sites. We uh, have to get this all back to them in the best quality we can, so we use satellites. In fact, that's the only way we have of getting it from where we are. Uh, and with that is the interactivity part, all the communications for the people driving the rovers, all the voices you hear, all of the uh, data on the computers, and everything they're seeing on their screens right now is coming through this data terminal, and we're doing it via satellite. Obviously, there's some delay, which they've experienced when they drive. Some of the pilots will see that when they make something happen, it takes a little while for it to physically do that. And uh, look, you can tell them about the experience we had. We had a phone call a minute ago when we were standing beside each other, and it was kind of hard to talk hearing yourself, isn't it? Yeah, it's like five. It's like half a second away. <laughs> it's hard to count. We'll have to show you how to count sometime when you're talking to yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, have a nice day. We're going to walk over to where all the, ca all the computers are. There's lots of wires on the ground. You've got to be careful not to fall. Okay, um, hi, how are you? I'm uh, pretty good. We have a student driver online for the Marzacod right now. Um, that's okay, I got on this mic here. Okay. Uh, the student driver is Brian, and he's from the pin site at Bell, and uh, he's all ready to drive the rover right now. So um, if we can switch to the rover camera, we can uh, start by deploying the arm. Brian, are you there? Okay, Brian, um, hold on a second. Let's see if we can get a, there we go, picture of the rover up. Oh, one of our engineers running out of the view. Okay, Brian, why don't you go ahead and hit the deploy arm command for me. Did you hit the command, Brian? 
Okay, there it is. I saw it. Now, it might take a second. Uh, last time we did this, it took a minute for the command to actually get through because of some of the satellite delays like Mike uh, Durbin was telling us about. So, let us um, watch that for a second. What's going to happen is the arm should unfold and uh, start taking a picture of the ground. Uh, right now, I'm going to switch you to a view from the camera arm itself. Uh, right now, you're looking at the camera, or rather, looking at the robot. And uh, there we go. There's a picture from the, the robot arm right now. And uh, you can see the picture's really washed out there. That's because it's really hot out on the lava flow right now. Okay. Um, yeah, Brian, it looks like the arm's not working right now for some reason. I'm going to check on that. If you can, let's do a pan and tilt command instead. And I'm going to switch over to your other camera view. Okay, why don't you uh, go and move the cameras to the right? Yeah, keep doing like you're just doing and move the camera right. Just like we practiced it. Go ahead and keep hitting that right command just like you were. Doing really good. Okay, there it goes. Okay, I'm going to see if we can see some live lava over here. Um, we're really close to the lava flow. As a matter of fact, the engineers out there told us that uh, we might have to move the rover uh, a little bit farther away from the lava because it's getting real close right now. Why don't you keep going right? If you can't hit the right, right button, Brian. Okay, good. All right. Uh, if you look there in your picture, you can, um, in addition to seeing the lava underneath the rover, you can see pictures of the wheels and uh, some of the electronics. So in addition to looking around you, you can kind of look at the rover and see how it's doing as well. Okay. If you keep on uh, panning up, Brian, maybe we can try and see some lava. Do you want to hit the up command, Brian? Keep going up. Okay. Oh, great. Really good. Okay. You see there? Oop. Too far. Here, let me help you out a second. I'll just bring you back down. Oh, good. Okay, you see there the ocean in the background. You can see the lava flow. Um, over to the left, you can see a steam vent where the lava is actually flowing into the ocean right now. Okay, uh, that's really good. That's a great picture from the uh, camera, Brian. And, um, okay, uh, looks like Looks like uh, we're ready to send this off to Bob now. So thanks again, Brian. You did a really good job driving. And um, you enjoyed we're going to check Jason project from the Big Island of Hawaii. And I hope you'll join us next year when the Jason 7 expedition goes to southern Florida and Key Largo when we're going to be living underwater. Until then, take care. Study hard. Bye-bye.